Go back. Discuss what we talked about last week so that we keep everything in its proper context. Now, last week we covered verses 1 through 4, which makes sense because that's bringing us now to verse 5. Now, what is Paul doing? What is taking place in this letter? Well, we know that Paul is in prison, he's in chains, surrounded by other prisoners. And why is he there? For preaching the gospel. But then we have Timothy, the elder, an elder of the, of the church in Ephesus. But Timothy is struggling. For, for the past two years, he's, been having, he's having to deal with false teachers. And these false teachers are coming in, spreading their heresy. And sadly, sadly, many in the congregation are holding on to those heretical teachings. And, and this is weighing on Timothy. It's wearing him out. It's crushing him. And, and Timothy may even be thinking at this point, and maybe it's time for me to just walk away from this. Maybe there is something else that I can do. So now we go back to Paul in prison, writing this letter to Timothy to what? To encourage him, but to also admonish him. Paul is having to remind Timothy of this calling, this desire that has been given to him. Like I said, Timothy may be wanting to give up, but Paul writes in the verses last week, do you, do you know where your strength comes from, Timothy? Because I think you're neglecting this. Your strength comes from the grace of Christ. Do, do you deserve that strength? No. Do any of you in here deserve the grace of Christ? No. That's why it is such a wonderful, beautiful gift that has been given to us, the sinner. But, but here Paul is talking to Timothy. Brother, you, you have this grace, and it's not just a one-time thing. No, this grace that has been given to you wasn't just for your salvation. It's to strengthen you. It's to draw you to the Word of God so that you continue to preach it boldly. Because it's going to be difficult, Timothy, as an elder. You are going to be attacked. It's not going to get any easier. Do not forget that, Timothy. Do not forget that, O oh church, about the grace of Christ that has been given to you. He then reminds Timothy, think about the words in which you have heard me preach. Think about the words that have come out of my mouth. Think about the men and the women by hearing the gospel have been regenerated. Think about those very men in which I've poured into, and now they are teachers. They are elders in the church. Timothy, now it's your turn. Paul, we're not for sure, but I would say he understood that this was it for him. Because Paul was never a free man again. He was killed. He was martyred for the truth. So, so it's almost as, as if Paul is passing over the torch to young Timothy. And now it's your turn. You think about how you, O oh, Timothy, grew in the word. Do you not want to be that man who is pouring into others' lives so that they too will mature in the faith? Timothy, you've been entrusted with the word. You've been given the ability to teach, to preach, to break it down so that it is understood. Do not throw that gift away. Now, let me pause here for a second because we know that not every single person in here has been called to be an elder. Not trying to be hateful, but especially women. That's not your calling. But every person in here, every believer in here has been given a gift. Do not neglect that gift that God has given to you. It is a gift from above. Paul kind of, in, in his writing, is letting Timothy know, do you know why you may be struggling right now, Timothy? And, and this goes to every single believer. But do you know why you may be struggling right now? Because of the suffering that's coming. 
You're going to have to endure this suffering as a believer. See, especially here in the West, you know what we have been sold today about Christianity? Man, you're a Christian. Everything's going to be okay. Everyone's going to like you. Matter of fact, God is going to bless you. That's not true. This is what Timothy was experiencing then. He's grasping this understanding that he's never going to be the most popular guy in the neighborhood. As a matter of fact, if you do it properly, you're probably going to be the most hated person in the neighborhood because the world doesn't want Christ. They don't want their sins revealed. But Timothy, this is what you have been called to do. And then he makes this comparison, that being Paul. He says, Timothy, along with every single believer, you've been called to be a soldier of Christ. And as a soldier, during that time of war, you're always on call 24-7, 365 days a year. Now, what we're dealing with as Christians is spiritual warfare, and that's real. We're not battling with the flesh. We're battling with the demonic. We're battling with those who hate Christ and him crucified and everything that he stands for. So, Timothy, you got to soldier up. You know, and that's part of what Paul is doing here. He's kind of smacking Timothy in the face. This is a wake-up call. And and to be honest with you, 1st and 2nd Timothy, this is a wake-up call to the elders. And, oh, church, you may be thinking, said this last week, this is really heavy on the elders. I'm not sure what we're supposed to get of this, Britt. Here's what you're supposed to get of this, church. This is what you are to expect of your pastors, those who are always on call and ready to endure. You don't want a sissy elder. You don't want someone who's not willing to stand for the truth. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not a point in time when the elder needs a break. When it becomes extremely heavy, then you would expect the other elders to come alongside him and take that workload upon themselves. But you do not want an elder who is not willing to endure. That's what Paul is telling Timothy. Basically, you got to man up, brother. You, you think this is going to be easy? No. But also as a soldier, you know that you've been called to place your life on the line. And without hesitation, for a true elder does not back down from a fight. They can't. How are they to guard the church if they're in the corner crying? How are they to protect the body from the wolves who are trying to get into the church? Paul is reminding Timothy, the world is never going to like you. But you're not called to please the world. You're called to please your Redeemer. That's it. That's the bottom line, not the world, not the people of this world, but the Redeemer. Now look at verse 5. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Paul loves sports. He's a man's man, let's be honest. He loves sports, And, and he's using this metaphor of an athlete once again. Now, during the time of this letter, the Greek games were extremely popular. And there were three conditions, let's say four, that every athlete must meet to compete. One, they had to be a true-born Greek. They had to prepare for their event for at least 10 months. And the third, they, of course, they had to hold to the rules set for that event. And four, They cannot test positive for anabolic steroids. (laughs) Would have made it a lot more entertaining, would it not? The fourth one's not real. Toss it out. 
Now, we do know if one of those requirements were not met, they would be disqualified. Now, let's look at this metaphor and how it relates to a believer. For one, to be a believer, we know that they must be born again from above. That heart must be regenerated. Their faith must be in Christ and him alone. One. Two. Because they have been born from above, because that heart has been, regen- been regenerated, you know what they're wanting to do now? They're wanting to be diligent and dedicated to the word. They're craving it. That's two. And three, a believer who is dedicated to the word, their life is going to reflect that. It's not just going to be lip service. Now, here's something else that we know about an elite athlete. They don't just show up on game day, do they? No, they must be dedicated. Eat, train, sleep, steroids. Eat, train, (laughs) sleep. Sorry. But but that's what they're doing. They're they're preparing for this event. And, And you think about the believer Yes, their faith is in Christ and Him alone, but they are studying the Word. They are pouring into it, and their life reflects that. Their daily walk, you can see Christ in them. It doesn't matter where they are. Now, is this saying that you're going to be perfect? Absolutely not. You are going to be battling the flesh. So you're not going to be perfect. But just like that athlete, you are to be training for it, to be holding to the word, to be training your family up in the word. Where if you're at work, your people, they should see Christ in you. Sadly, today we, we treat Christianity as if it is just a one time event. How do you know you're a believer? Well, after church one Sunday, we had been singing just as you are for 25 minutes. And, and I felt like I should probably get up and walk down front and say the Lord's Prayer. And I did. And then that's how I know I'm a Christian. Does your life reflect that? Because that's nowhere in Scripture, by the way. But but so often, that's what we base our Christianity on. It is the sinner's prayer, walking the aisle. But that's it. It was a one-time experience. But if you were to be around you, no one would think, oh, that's a brother or sister in Christ. Church, a true believer loves the word. They love to fellowship with the body. This is what they have been called to do. And that doesn't mean that on the Sunday morning, sometimes you get up and you're like, ugh, bedside Baptist feels really good, right? There's going to be those mornings. But as believers, you think about what Christ has done for you, and you're telling me you you can't get up and worship with the body? It's important, church, or even your prayer life. Your prayer life is extremely important as well. This is what it is like to be a true believer. It's not just a one-time experience. True faith brings you to the Word, and that truth is going to pour out in your daily life, in your thoughts, your words, and your deeds Now, once again, this metaphor isn't saying that you have to work your way into heaven. That's not what it's saying at all. What it is saying, though, is that a true believer is going to show true fruits of being a believer. And just like that athlete, you have to be dedicated to it. You're going to have to train yourself. Because even though that athlete may be competing against another team or another man or another woman, if 
the Christian is going to be competing against their flesh, meaning their sins. But now you've been given that ability to crush those sins. And we can't forget about the spiritual warfare that is going to continue going on around us until Christ returns. We must be dedicated. The other thing that the athlete must do, we said that they must hold to the rules of that sport. That makes sense, right? I mean, if you have boundaries, you can't say, well, I'm going to run outside this boundary, and that way I can score. You can't do that. But you think about the Christian life. We, we have his word laid out before us. And I know what you're thinking, Britt, this is sounding awfully legalistic. Hang with me. But as believers, we have the word before us. Do you think that you have the option to say, now look, I, I know this is what the word of God says, but I want to go outside the boundaries. You think that's an option? No, it's not an option. This is the word of God. These are his commands. How dare you think that you can do whatever you want to do? This goes back to being dedicated to what God has given us, that being his entire counsel. From the old to the new, from Genesis to the book of maps, we have it all. We are called to hold to God's holy word. All right, now we got another metaphor. Paul is just pumping these out right now. Look at verse 6. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. You can't forget contextually what's happening. Paul's in chains, in a prison, surrounded by prisoners, encouraging his brother, Right? And it's here in this metaphor that, that he's trying to prove a point to Paul. And know what you're thinking. Well, no dub for it. That, that's why he's using this metaphor. And I'd say, good. Farmers during the time of the New Testament were paid by receiving a portion of the crops. The first portion of the crops. See, it's the farmer who's out there busting it, hustling, starts early, stays late, works in the heat, the cold, the rain, just farming away. Not complaining. This is his job. This is how he eats. This is how he provides for his family. When it's time to plant, oh farmer, the farmer is going to plant. When it's time to remove those weeds, the farmer is going to remove those weeds. And when it's time to plow, you plow. And when the crop is ready, you harvest the crop. It's a mundane routine, is it not? Now, why does the farmer work himself to the bone for the harvest? But here's the difference. Unlike a soldier or an athlete, the farmer, most of the time, is working alone. He's not receiving any credit for it. And for many Christians, that is is their life. The same routine over and over and over. You see what Paul is saying to Timothy? Bro, grow up. What, what do you think? You're going to be some type of rock star that you're going to be noticed by everyone and they're going to love you? And, and sadly, this is part of Christianity today. Well, we think that if we get up, provide for our family by going to work, coming home, helping the kids with schoolwork, loving your wife, we think, well, I can't be a good Christian. That's what you've been called to do. But, but we think, and listen, there's nothing wrong with going out into the mission fields and providing for people. That's, what you, that's the gift that has been given to you. But being a Christian is not about being noticed. It's about loving Christ, and part of that is loving and providing for your family, meaning you're going to do the same thing over and over and over again. But through doing that, you're showing your family the love of Christ. By spending time with them, you're showing them the love of Christ. So Timothy, just because you keep having to deal with these same issues over and over and over again, that's what you've been called to do. 
to care for these people, to teach these people, to guard these people. And why? For the farmers, for the, the first crops. But for the believer and for Timothy, it's to glorify our Lord and Savior. But that's how we glorify him. Again, our, our good works are never going to earn us salvation. Nor are they going to be done to keep our salvation. No, the believer's good works are how they work out their salvation. It's evidence for their salvation. Remember this, Timothy. R remember this during those days when you are struggling, when, when the church is driving you crazy. But also you, O oh believer, you remember this when your husband is driving you mad, when, when your kids are bringing you to the brink of insanity. This is what you have been called to do. And yes, it's going to play over and over again, sometimes like Groundhog's Day. Now look at verse 7. Think over what I say. For the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Listen, I, I said this earlier. There, there, there are going to be times in the elder's life when they are just worn out. And, and, and the church needs to understand that during those moments, that elder needs to take a break. But also the elder surrounding the one who is worn out, like I said, that they, they need to step up and take care of that elder by giving him that break. So, so here Paul is telling Timothy, again, I, I understand that, that, that you're tired. And there's times where it just seems like the attacks keep coming. And, and there's something else that you would rather be doing. And, and I also know that there's times where you feel like your work is in vain. But this isn't a reason to give up. This isn't a reason to look to the world for comfort and answers. Paul is telling Timothy, I want you to ask yourself a question, Timothy. But because sometimes when you're, when you're burned out, when, when you feel like the stress of the world is, is just starting to crush you, Timothy, who, who are you trying to please? Timothy, is your life and how you live your life, is it reflecting Christ or is it reflecting the world? What is your study life? What is it like right now? Are you in the word? Are you praying? Or are you more concerned with worldly affairs? And also, Timothy, have you gotten a little bit lazy? Are you still guarding the church with the word? And Timothy, are you denying yourself of worldly pleasures to remain devoted to the one who redeemed you? See, these questions aren't just for Timothy. We should be asking ourselves these very questions. Timothy, if you are in the word, if you are continue to mature in the faith, if you are still praying, if you're still fellowshipping with the body, yes, those times are going to be difficult. But if you remain doing those very things, the Lord is going to give you the understanding in everything. Why? Because where does our truth come from, church? From the word. That, that's it. Not from the world. If the world says something that is truthful, do you know where that truth came from? From the word. When we have the answer right in front of us. But, but sometimes even the most devout Christians will begin to look to the world instead of the word. 
And, and sometimes we need to be reminded of that because there's not a single question out there that the word does not answer. So everything that you're dealing with, Timothy, pour back into the word. It's there. This is how the biblical, a Christian's biblical worldview should be developed. By holding to the truth and that truth, a biblical worldview. Do you know why we hold to that? Because it's pleasing to the Lord. So, so sometimes, Timothy, when you're struggling, you have to look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, am I doing what I need to be doing as a believer? Because I can almost guarantee you, 95% of the time, when we as believers are struggling, when we're tired, when we're weary, it's because we're not in the word of God. We're not fellowshipping with the brothers and sisters of Christ. Our prayer life is wrecked in some way, shape, or form. Now look at verse 8. It says, remember Jesus Christ. Timothy is struggling. Remember Jesus Christ. Think about the life of the Savior. And do you know what our Savior, you know what he did not do? He did not compromise the truth. He did not water down the word. We do not serve a sissified Jesus. Our Jesus is a man's man with callous hands who would stand up to the most powerful men of his time. That's my Jesus. You can take Pantene Jesus all day long. I want the real Jesus. He did not water down the word to gain respect. As a matter of fact, he did the opposite. He stood firm in the word no matter the cost. If you will, let, let's jump out of 2 Timothy for a moment here. Let's go to Matthew 23. This is the Jesus I serve. Look at verse 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Mm. I mean, those are fighting words. He continues, Woe to you blind guides who say, If anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, If anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier, weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guide, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. That's my Jesus. He actually keeps going, but for the sake of time, I'm going to stop there. And he was speaking to the most powerful men in the region, and he did not back down from them. Now, now put yourself in, in, in Timothy's shoes for a moment here, right? Here he is, and, and, and listen, I, I'm not saying he, he doesn't have a reason to be burned out. I'm not saying that at all. But here you have the Apostle Paul in chains, and then he goes straight to Jesus, chewing out the scribes and Pharisees. You, you tell me that it's like, oh, 
Here Timothy is like, I don't, I don't, I have no comebacks there, right? What, what, do, I, what do I say to that? Remember Jesus. Remember the Redeemer. Remember the only one who saves because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Remember Jesus. For he is the reason why you are doing what you are doing. He is the reason why you are teaching the truth so that it edifies the body. He is the reason you are pouring into future teachers so that they will be doing the same thing that you are, Timothy. Man, this is a wake-up call. And it shouldn't just be a wake-up call to the elders, but the entire church. And then he goes to say, risen from the dead. Okay, so remember Jesus, risen from the dead. Well, Jesus had to be killed first, right? That, that's, that's how this works. So, Timothy, why was Jesus killed? Do you, do you remember? Do you, do you remember what he did to get himself brutally beaten to where he no longer looked human? Do you, do you remember what he did while he was carrying that cross and, and his flesh was just hanging from his body to where even bones and organs were exposed? Do, do you remember what he did? Tell the world that he's the Savior, that he's the Redeemer that he's the one that the Old Testament is pointing to. Again, he did not water down the word so that the good news would spread. He was killed for that, Timothy. Now, I understand you're having a weak moment, but once again, you've been called to proclaim the good news, to preach the gospel, that he is the only way for a sinner to stand righteous before God. It is him and him alone. For they tried to stop him. They tried to kill him. But death could not hold the Savior. And because what he did, Timothy, he took your sins upon himself. Your sins hung him on the cross that very day. Your sins put him in the ground. But it is by way of the Holy Spirit that brought him back to life. The same Holy Spirit that regenerates the heart of every single believer so that they can believe this wonderful good news. That's what you need to remember, Timothy. Timothy. Now, does it sound like Paul's coming down a little bit hard on Timothy? Yeah, maybe. But again, sometimes as believers, we need a two-by-four to the face. We need to be reminded. For we know that Christ did not stay dead. There is no body in the tomb. He is risen. But we also know over a thousand people saw the resurrected Savior. That's a lot of eyewitnesses, church. That's a lot of evidence. For we worship him because he did not stay in the tomb. We worship and serve the living Jesus. Okay. We're not going to make it through, but we're we're going to cover just a little bit more, so bear with me, okay? Paul goes on to write, the offspring of David as preached in my gospel. Now, this speaks of the humanity of Jesus. Remember, Jesus, 100% God, 100% man. I can't work that mouth out, but that's what the word says, and that's what we hold to. So, So we understand this is speaking on the humanity of Jesus, that Jesus was born into this world by way of a woman. Mm. (laughs) There's a whole sermon right there today, right? Especially in today's culture. And part of the human aspect of Jesus is his bloodline. For what did the Old Testament tell us? What did the prophets tell us? That Jesus was going to come from the bloodline of David. And lo and behold, where did he come from? From the bloodline of David. Prophecy fulfilled. Matter of fact, every single prophecy about Jesus in the Old Testament, over 300, he fulfilled. You know what that is mathematically? Impossible. 
And yet, that's what our Savior did. So, O Timothy, Christ is your Savior. And you know what has been promised to the believer when their faith is in him? It is have everlasting life with him. So, grasp this, O Timothy, because I know you're worried about the here and now, right? But because your faith is in Christ, why do you worry about what's going to happen to you in this life when you know the outcome of it? Why are you worried about something happening to you for your preaching, your teaching, and standing for the word when you know the outcome? It's everlasting life with him. I mean, Timothy, your sins have been washed away by what Christ has done. You've been redeemed. You you need to take that worry and place it aside and continue doing what you have been called to do. And because, Timothy, because you have been redeemed, that cannot be stripped from you because it is a gift from God and there are no takebacks. The church, we we still need to hear this today. We still need to hear the good news. Yes, that's what we believe in, but we need to be reminded of it. This is what Paul is doing with Timothy. During his darkest hours, he's pointing him back to the gospel, back to the truth. Look at John 10, 27 through 30. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is where your strength lies, O Timothy, in this truth you know, sometimes even as Christians, we become self-obsessed, don't we? A little self-absorbed. This could be what's happening to Timothy. He's more worried about himself than preaching the word, protecting the church. And that happens. It does. But you remember why you are here, O oh believer. You remember what you have been called to do, to go out and make disciples to not back down from the world even though they are going to hate you because you never know who that person is in the world that God has elected to hear the gospel so that their heart is regenerated. And it could very well be those words coming from your mouth, O believer. Okay, we're going to close up with verse 8. We're we're done right here. He goes on to say, as preached in my gospel. Now, Paul is not saying the way in which I understand the gospel. This is my interpretation of the gospel. That's not what he's saying here. This is the message that was revealed to him by Jesus and was entrusted to him as an apostle of Jesus. And what was that message that was given to him? To proclaim the good news to the Gentiles, to tell the people about Christ His life, his death, his burial, resurrection, the ascension, and eventually his return. Listen, church, there is only one gospel. The one that Jesus revealed to Paul and the same gospel that has been revealed to us through the Holy Word. There is only one. And that's what you, O Timothy, have been called to preach and teach There is no other way. The same goes for you, O church. There is only one gospel that you are to tell this world. And there is one command that has been given to you that you are to go out and make disciples. Actually, there's more than just one command. Let me take that back. That's a big one, though, all right? 
That's a big one. All right. I look forward to seeing you all next week, starting in verse 9. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, as always, we're so grateful, thankful for this time in which we are able to dig into the truth, the holy truth. And Lord, we're we're thankful that that Paul was inspired by you to write this letter because it is such a a great reminder to the church and what they are to expect of the elders, but also what the church is to expect of themselves, that we have been given the strength to carry on during those darkest of hours. And that strength comes from you, the grace of Christ, so that we can endure those moments But that strength also is to overcome our fear, our fear of telling others about the good news because of what they may think of us. But at the end of the day, because of your word, because of your truth, we understand that we're not called to please the world. We're called to please you and you alone. So Lord, now as as a church body, we just pray that you give us the strength in which we know that you have, but a reminder to us that that strength is there so that we can go out into the world and tell others about the only true living Savior. We say these things in his holy name. Amen.